and get paid next to nothing on HBO. <laughs> that's right. That's, that's pretty that's right impressive. Right. That's right. They, they pay horribly, don't they? Well, not for my family lineage. I'm making more money than anybody who who raised me. Sure, I'm doing great. I mean, I'm very happy. Oh, I'm, there's people that pay a lot more, but then you have to do it their way. Right. That's why a lot of people don't do shows on HBO because. That's one of the reasons, like, a lot of people think it's just the network's keeping folks down, but every that door's just been open at HBO for everybody all these years. Uh -huh. Anything goes on the show? I mean, you can deal with any topics? It's I mean, not a single thing you can't... You're a married do. guy on the show. Yeah. You, you, uh, you are, uh, uh, like, a middle-class guy, lower-middle-class lower guy? Lower-middle-class, working at a muffler shop. And uh, w w you can talk about any subjects, no anything. subjects are taboo. Anything. We, used, we wondered if, like, HBO would say at some point, you know, even for HBO, that's too much... We have a, a one episode where in the scene, Jim Norton that plays my one of my friends, he says cunt about 40 times. 40 cunt. And, and, and it's about, it's a religious conversation wow. about what the nature of God is. Because this guy says to him, of course there's a God, where did you come from? And he says, my mother's cunt. And the guy <laughs> says, well, where did she come Where did she, her, she come from? Her mother's cunt. And it goes back all the way. And Well, then where did all the cunts come from? And he says, one giant cunt. And the guy says, that's God. So in this show, we say that God is a giant cunt. <laughs> did you get any letters? We're waiting for the note. We're waiting for the note. We're, We're waiting, waiting for, for the, the note, note from, from HBO. HBO. Yeah. And they said about that episode, their only note was, you know, you mentioned TBS Broadcasting in another scene, and that's not cool because they're a partner. <laughs> yeah. that was it. I love that. Yeah, I like that. So the show is really about you and your wife, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's right. also about, like, well, the woman that plays my wife on the show, she's, uh, she's, hot. Hot. she's great, Pamela, and she's really funny. And one reason You're attracted to her in real life? Oh, she's very cute. Yeah. You yeah. cast Definitely. this uh, program, didn't you? What's that? You cast I cast it. it. Yeah, yeah, I got to cast Victor. my wife. But it's yeah. a huge mistake to cast your wife because she's hot, because then you got to carry her comedically throughout the show, you know. So well, I found somebody funny. Yes. And the main reason I hired her also is because we started talking about marriage about our marriages during the casting session, and she had some hilarious misery to impart about her marriage. So do you jerk off a lot in your marriage? Yeah. You do? Know. Yeah. Do you deal with that in the show? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. 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 Oh, Howard, he's in the closet. They, they live in, like, the honeymooners' apartment. And when apartment. she goes to put the kid to bed, he goes into the broom closet to jerk off. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah, that that just me. Was that based on your real life? Um, yeah. I do you have a jerk-off room? Oh, do I have a jerk off room? No, I, I wish I had a jerk off room. Right. I'm down in the basement by the boiler. Like That's a, a direct ripoff of a honeymooners episode. Yeah. Nothing, I'm jerking off. <laughs> Actually, Louie told me in the green room that. He's at the point now where if it comes between jerking off and taking a really good shit, he'll go for the long shit. Yeah, split. because that's what, when my wife and kids leave, that fantasy is now I can shit for hours. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> and I love shitting. That's Me too. I'm... I love a two-hour yeah. home no. field shit. I love shitting is my favorite thing. I don't know why they call it number two. Or you ever jerk off and shit one. at the same time? Maybe that'll just send you into nirvana. I've <laughs> jerked off. Soon after shitting, That's and that amazing. was a bummer. It was <laughs> depressing. I'll never do that again. And all of these things are dealt with in the uh, new sitcom. Yeah, every one of them. We don't shy away from anything. Then i got to watch it. Yes. What did you want to try to do with Lucky Louie that you thought hadn't been done before on a half-hour studio audience kind of sitcom? Well, I guess it wasn't so much that it hadn't been done before, but I knew that it hadn't been done for an awfully long time to do a show that uh, just felt very honest and was kind of brutally funny, I guess is what I wanted to do. Uh, so you need a place that you can have really blunt edges. And uh, I, today, language is part of that, you know, I think. And people really talk the way that they talk on my show to me. Now, uh, some of what you want to talk, talk about that you can't really do on a broadcast mm -hmm. sitcom is uh, to, to talk about sex. And in, in judging from the first few episodes of your show, to talk about some of the frustrations and disappointments and bad communication surrounding mm -hmm. uh, sex. I, I mean, part of it is kind of like the joylessness of sex. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Or just the normalcy of sex. Uh, the the, okay, the non-fantasy yeah. non of sex. Um, because when you're married, you still need sex as an important part of your life, but it's not... Um, it's no longer a fantasy. It's a obligation to one another. And, and I mean that in a warm way, even though it doesn't sound warm, that you owe it to each other to give each other this comfort, you know? But it becomes less sort of like there's no music behind it and no moans. There's just more like, hey, could you not do that to my back, please? You know, <laughs> it's more sort of like familiar. Is so a couple trying to stay excited and happy in a marriage... I find that to be a very sweet endeavor, and it's very painful at times and very silly. Let me ask you to describe your character of Louis on the show. Um, I think that I play a guy that's like 
me without the career that I've had, more or less. Just a guy who's, um, you know, graduated high school and then never got much traction, worked service industry and uh, those kind of jobs and wasn't sure what he's supposed to be trying to do. It's it's the way that I felt uh, when I was growing up and most of my friends. Um, the difference is that <clears throat> I kind of caught on to this comedy stuff and found something, but a lot of people I know didn't. And I remember what it felt like to not know where you're going to go. But what happens often is you meet somebody. You become directed by the fact that you met someone you want to be with. And so it's a, he's married to a woman who he now wants to please. And next thing he knows, he's got a kid and a lot of responsibility he doesn't feel all that prepared for. So he's trying to play catch up a little bit. Um, that's about it. Otherwise, he's just he's a little frustrated, I think. I feel really dumb talking about him in the third person. It's really me. Um, and just describe just his wife. Describe his wife for us. Oh, Kim is a nurse, and she's someone who works really hard and is raising her uh, daughter and is fiercely protective of her and um, w- lives in a, the same limiting world of that. You know, when you live in these towns like, you know, Lynn, Massachusetts or Youngstown, Ohio, and you want to be healthy and you want to raise your kid without a barrage of, you know, Elmo and sugar and high fructose corn syrup, you have to really battle, you know. And uh, I think that she sort of, to her, her husband will do just fine. He, you know, clean him up. He's doing just fine, basically. Um, but it's it, the, the wife in, in, in your show is, uh, is always mm-hmm. trying to, in some way, control her husband's behavior. Like there's a whole episode that revolves around him really eating junk food and continuing to eat it after a good friend gets a heart attack. So Yes. So yeah. um so she's in the position kind of a playing mom to her husband and saying, No, you can't you shouldn't be eating that cake, you shouldn't be having mm-hmm. you know, the the hamburger and stuff. So uh, is that the is that coming out of like your marriage? Do you feel like like you've put your wife in the position of having to be your mother sometimes? Well, sometimes Notice how I'm blaming I mean, I you. Think, <laughs> <clears throat> no, of course it is. It's my fault. She's really. Uh, I think she resents having to be in that position. Um, but I, I think it's close to something in my marriage and through what I've learned uh, from a lot of this stuff. Uh, when you first get married as a guy, you just immediately are in the hole. You immediately assume that you're incapable of having a real relationship and that this woman's going to teach you. So <laughs> the two of you start figuring out the guy and his problem. That's the first problem of every marriage is what's wrong with this dumb boy of a man. Let's try to make him civilized. And But then after a few years go by, you look at the woman and you go, this woman is crazy. <laughs> what's wrong with her? Why does she have this need to do that? And then you end up settling hopefully somewhere in between. Um, but so I think both parties have problems. The guy just can't get a grip on himself. And the woman has a deep need to have the guy be just what she wants, which... Uh, you know, it's 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 her own issue too, I think, and I think Kim definitely has that. She, she wants to grab this guy by the throat a lot, and um, you know, I don't know. I'm still haven't figured it all out. My my guest is comic Louis C.K. and he has a, a new series called Lucky Louis, a new sitcom on HBO. It just premiered, and it's on right after Entourage. Um, one of the things that your character is dealing with in your show Lucky Louis is, um, you know, trying, he's trying to make friends with his neighbors next door. They're an African-American couple. He wants to be their friends. He's also very self-conscious of the fact that they're black and he's white. Mm -hmm. So in wanting to do the right thing, he often does the wrong thing. Can you Mm -hmm. talk a little bit about trying to write that relationship and what, what, what issues you're trying to raise there? Well, that <clears throat> comes out of a lot of reality in my life because it's just my generation was segregated from black people. And I grew up in near Boston, which is a very segregated city. And we actually had black kids um, that were bussed in. I mean, it sounds like we were having – we had them bussed in for our amusement. It was fun. <laughs> um, <clears throat> they were you – know, let's get some black kids bussed in here. That's what this place needs. No, uh, you know, Boston had all this busing and there was these kids that were from other neighborhoods that were black. There was zero black people lived from where I lived and, and um, they were in our school. And I used to just awkwardly sit at their table because I wanted to know them. Um, I actually, m- most people don't believe me, but I'm half Mexican and I came to this country from Mexico. I was born here and left before I was one. 
And so I came here not speaking English, and I had the experience of coming here like as an immigrant, which is weird because I'm very white and Irish looking. Um, but anyway, but so you're also part Jewish. I, yeah, my dad's dad was Jewish, and it's a mess, Terry. I'm a dog. I'm a <laughs> mutt. But that's the way, you know, it's great. But uh, so when I started going to elementary school and junior high school and seeing these black kids that were, I just wanted to know them. And I thought it was awkward to me that they were this other people, you know. <clears throat> so I used to just sit at their table at the cafeteria during lunch and just sit there smiling and hoping they'd be my friend. <laughs> they would just look at me like, what's your problem? And eventually I did make friends with a lot of them, but it had to be done awkwardly. That the, the races are still segregated amazingly, and the only way to actually come across and, and make a contact is to do it self-consciously, kind of racistly, you know, because you're really saying I want to know you because you're black. Um, there's just no other way to do it. And it is important to me that my daughter know black people. I want her to know every, everybody. I don't want her to have this. So I have to make this dumb effort. So that story became really important. And actually the part that I tell at in the pilot um, is a true story that a black Just describe fellow, the story, yeah. We were living actually in upstate New York at the time, and, and the, uh, a black guy, there's nobody black where we were up there. A black guy came and fixed our refrigerator, and my daughter really bonded with him over the course of a day. You know, she was like two, and when kids are that age, some knowing somebody for a day, it's like she's known him forever, you know. She just really liked the guy, and he's, she would say, refrigerator, and he'd say, yeah, refrigerator, refrigerator. And then we would, came to New York City, and we were on the subway. And she pointed at the first black guy she saw and said, refrigerator. <laughs> and I was so shocked and horrified. And I thought, oh, my God, I have to get this <laughs> little girl around some black people. This is not cool. And at, one of my best friends is Chris Rock. And it's funny because he has a daughter around almost exactly the same age. And he was, he's having the same problem because I told him of the story. He's having the same problem with his little girl who's black is that she doesn't know enough black kids. And he has to struggle because he lives in a nice part of New Jersey. He has to make a maximum effort to make sure his daughter sees enough black people to feel comfortable and identify. So it's, yeah, it's weird because of the segregation. You have to make these awkward, unnatural efforts. Let's talk a little bit about uh, your character as a father on the show. Mm -hmm. You're a father of two kids? I have two kids, yeah. How old are they? I have they? a four-year-old and a one-year-old, both girls. The character in um, in in the sitcom seems to, you know, be a pretty caring father, but he also seems very overwhelmed by the responsibility mm -hmm. and kind of unprepared for it. Did you feel that way when you became a father, like you really weren't ready? Oh, totally. I mean, I still feel that way because it's not like I'm done. They're four and one. It's not like I can pack them off to camp now and forget about them. There's <laughs> a huge amount of work to do. And it changes. It. It's like a. this is probably the worst thing I'll ever say in my life, but it's like a like an AIDS virus. It just keeps morphing and you can't you can't fight it because every day you think you've figured out fatherhood and you've mixed an antidote to it. Uh, and then, you know, the next day, it's like, what? who are these people? I don't even know who these people are. They were, <laughs> weren't living in my house yesterday. And even who am I? And who is my wife? Every day you wake up and there's a whole new... I mean, that's like some crazy kind of movie. Like that every day you wake up with a different group of people and a different home and a different set of problems. And um, so you never get to use any experience is just thrown in the toilet. It's – you never – you just – the only experience you start to glean from uh, any wisdom is just that, you know, be prepared for anything and, and just having resiliency is all you can have. Has it, um, been, has it been hard for you to be the authority figure and set limits for your children? Because it, it, seems, it seems to me that when you were young, you were probably the kind of kid who was always violating those limits and defying yeah. the authority figures in your life. <laughs> Yes, that's I don't know how you picked up on that, but that's true. No, I it is weird to be saying how don't you do this because um I identify with anybody who does something they shouldn't be doing. So, including my my daughters. And you know, part of you wants them to build that strength too. Like part of you when your daughter's screaming at you because she doesn't want to put on her shoes or whatever crazy thing. You you want to um you know, throw her in a garbage bin. But at the same time, <laughs> you're you're pr proud of her and you're happy that she's building the strength and the skill to stand up for herself, you know. Um, 
But uh, no, I think that that's to me the crux of what this show is, is that 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 is the way you feel. You feel constantly bent over and punched in the face by parenthood and marriage at the same time. And if you're honest, that's how you feel. And a lot of sitcoms that I've seen distill it to its perfect moments where the parent is making just the right decision because America is watching this parent and they want him to do just the right thing with perfect evenness. And I guess people get kind of a satisfaction from watching a beautifully written, balanced parental moment. But I find that really boring and I certainly don't find it funny. Um, so the people on our show, yeah, they make awful decisions and they don't, they don't connect together as a stream of parenthood or philosophy. At least it doesn't feel that way. Maybe if we look back over what we've done with our kids, we go, yeah, I guess we're doing okay. I guess we basically have a hand on the tiller. We're still pointing in the right direction. I've seen three episodes of your show. Uh, Mm -hmm. I've had an advanced DVD. But um, mm-hmm. it seems to me in the first episode, the the daughter figures into it more than than in the other two I've seen. And I'm wondering if she's going to be like Richie on the Dick Van Dyke show where like there's some episodes <laughs> where they have a daughter and some – I mean like where there's some episodes where they have a son and some episodes where they don't really seem mm-hmm. to have a son. Is right. it going to be that way with your daughter on, on the show? No, we don't want it to be. And it, it's hard to shoot with a child because uh, – well, you know, the funny thing is that's what we thought – it's really not the kid herself. It's the laws governing u- usage of her. In other words, um, she can only stay till a certain hour. Once you open her clock, you've got it. It's running fast. Oh. And and so we actually did one episode that is all her. It's, it's called Discipline, and I'm not sure exactly when it airs, but it's one that I actually wrote with Pamela Adlon. We wrote it together, and uh, it's about trying to um, – a couple trying to clamp down and discipline their child. So, so did did that did that episode on disciplining the daughter mm-hmm, draw mm-hmm. on any real experiences in your life that you could tell us about? Sure. Well, actually, the story came from Pamela because she had she's got three girls. Uh, Pamela Adlon, that plays my wife, and she she's got this wild brood of three kids, and uh, they uh, one of them. Um, was really she's just been nuts you know um she's sort of uh, like a changeling she turned into this crazy person and so pamela and her husband started trying uh, uh timeouts and uh at one point pamela told me some of this amazing story of putting um her daughter in a um the laundry room and holding the door closed and her daughter's pounding on the door and screaming, I'm sorry, you know, like angrily, <laughs> screaming herself hoarse while Pamela's on the other side of the door, you know, bawling, trying to keep her in there. I mean, it's just there's so much drama in just trying to do the simplest thing with your kid. And she told me this beautiful story, and we, we and, and also the undercutting, it, it was sort of half her story, half mine. My side of the story was that every time I try to discipline my kid, my wife would, would undercut like I would be locked in a battle of wills with my daughter. Um, to, and to the point, here's the point it got to. I was, I was uh, giving my daughter a bath and I said, it's time to brush your teeth. And she said, uh, no, she just refused to brush her teeth. And I said, okay, if you don't brush your teeth and no books tonight, you're not going to get any books. And she said, yes, books and no brush my teeth. She's <laughs> like a monkey, you know, that just learned to talk. And I'm like, no, no, no brushing teeth, no books. It's that simple. Yes, books, no brushing teeth. And so, um, and then she said, you brush my teeth. This is how it goes. See, it's like really tricky. You brush my teeth. And I'm thinking, is that compromise? Am I giving in by brushing her teeth? And I just made a quick judgment and said, no, you brush your teeth or no books. <laughs> and then my wife said, um, from the other room, my wife was listening and my wife said, can you please come in here for a minute? And my, and I go, no, I can't. And then my daughter said, yes, go talk to mama, go talk to mama right now. Cause she knew <laughs> what's going to happen. So I go in the other room and my, my wife, wife says, it's not a good idea to use books as a weapon. They're important to her. And also, I brush her teeth sometimes for her, and you should do that. And I go, no, that's not the point. The point is, you, it's, it's, I'm right no matter what. You have to go with me. You can't do this to me. And so I go in the other room, and she says, what did Mama say? <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I'm like, nothing. She didn't say anything. No, yes, she said that I don't have to. She said I don't have to. <laughs> like, she knew it. So that's what this episode is a combination of that experience of mine 
and Pamela's um, with with the timeouts, and it's it's it was a really interesting one to shoot because I do I I, I give this kid a timeout in the closet of our ha- of our apartment, and we were really afraid that. Or we expected that the audience would boo me and that I would be a tyrant throughout the episode mm-hmm. because it's me trying to have this iron fist in this house. But when we shot it, people were cheering me and applauding and they were booing Pamela <laughs> and they were booing the kid. <laughs> they booed the kid. So we're constantly shocked by people's reaction. It's really That's one of the funnest parts is being surprised. What were some of the sitcoms that you grew up with, the ones that you particularly liked and the ones that you particularly did not? <laughs> um, I always liked um, All in the Family. I loved, and I always loved the Honeymooners when I would see it in reruns and stuff. Um, even more so later in life, the Honeymooners. But um, I just thought All in the Family was such an awesome show, and I also liked Good Times, uh, and also Barney Miller, which doesn't have much relation to this show, except for that the people on Barney Miller are very ordinary. Um, you would never see a guy like Jack Sue being the star of a sitcom today or the dude that played Wojohowitz. You know, those were just average Americans. And uh, so there was a lot I loved about that show, too. I didn't like shows like – and this is just personal, subjective. I don't judge these shows. They just didn't hit with me. Shows like Cheers when I started getting older and um, Frasier in those shows and Friends, I just don't connect with those shows. They're very slick and they're very perfect – and the people are are pretty, and they're shot very nicely, and they they stopped feeling like these raw theatrical productions that I grew up watching. These Norman Lear shows, where people are just dropping wild, wild statements in front of an audience, and that you just feel the kinetic energy of this kind of honesty. That's what I thought that sitcoms were supposed to be. So when they became this kind of trading of Harvard written writerly lines and you know cuteness I stopped being interested that's just personal let's get back to your new um, sitcom on HBO Lucky Louie mm-hmm. you play a character called Louie you are a character you are a real person named Louie so <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, you know there's a history of this now on TV and I know th- that you're friends with Seinfeld uh, you mm-hmm. used to open for him I think uh, I, years ago years yeah. ago okay so did you mm-hmm. ask him for advice on uh, Like things to be careful of when you're doing a show, when you're doing a sitcom with your name in the title, where the where the line between you and the character is a little blurry. Um, I guess I don't care if there's a line or not. Like I don't feel any any. um, I don't think it's important that there be a line. I did call Jerry. uh, I used to open for him back when I was very young, and he gave me um, he gave me a lot of really great advice back then. He was very uh, giving that way. And uh, I lost touch with him. I didn't know him really during his having his show. But I'm I'm good for one call to like if I call Jerry, he'll call me back as long as I keep it down to like once every two years. <laughs> like I can't keep keep calling Jerry. <laughs> uh, the best advice I ever got from Jerry was when I was like 19 and I opened for him in a theater and uh, and it was like uh, an amazing audience. <clears throat> and I would do a joke and instead of laughing, they would applaud. And I'd never had that happen before, like long applause breaks. And I didn't know what to do during the applause. I just sit there going, what do I do now? So I asked Jerry, what do you do during applause? And he says, you have to stay in the bit. They're applauding and reacting to what you just said. So just stay in that moment. Just inhabit that moment until they're done applauding. That was the best comedy advice I ever got. And uh, I still use it on the show. I mean, I tell all the actors on my show that. Because the nature of our show is that it's shot in front of an audience and that the audience mitigates the performance. So when people say something explosive, which we often do on this show, often the audience goes crazy and they have to wait it out. And a lot of people weren't used to that. And they said, what do I do? And I said, just stay in it. Stay in the moment. The thing you said that got that response, your face should still be saying it and just hold it. Your show, in the way, has the look of... An earlier sitcom, um, mm-hmm. like from the earlier days of television, m- maybe like the Honeymooners era or something, mm-hmm. where it's kind of mm-hmm. shot almost in real time. And though it's shot, mm-hmm. it's not shot on film. I think it's shot on on, on video. That's right. Uh, but but is there a certain look that you were going for? No, definitely. Because uh, when I started, I did research when I started making this show, um, and I wanted to do a show that felt really real and that was just based on the comedy 
Um, and I, I went back and I looked at uh, All in the Family, and I realized that at a time where they were shooting a lot of television on film that was shot on videotape. I think Mary Tyler Moore was shot on film. And it's very nice looking, very lush. But there's something disconnecting about film. It, like you're watching an image that was projected onto celluloid, and it's not real. But videotape just feels immediate and naked and very raw. And so when I watched the All in the Family episodes, I realized this show had a very raw, beautifully naked feel to it. And I actually called Norman Lear. I got him on the phone because somebody told me that Norman Lear shot on video because they forced him to for budget reasons. And I called him and I asked him and he said, absolutely not. They wanted me to shoot All in the Family on film and I demanded videotape because it felt <clears throat> like you were there, like a theatrical experience. And because it made the interaction with the audience seem real. And then I contacted the people that made Roseanne, because Roseanne was the last show shot on videotape. That's a sitcom. And they said the same thing. Roseanne demanded that it be video. And she, she said she liked it because it's like the news. It's like you're watching the news. You're not watching some fancy show. You're just watching people that happen to be on, on the news. So we got the same videotape that, like, the football games are shot on or the news is shot on. And we made the sets. We we got the Honeymooners uh, blueprint, actually, of you their did? set. Yeah, I went and found that and and looked at their dimensions and studied them. And our, our set is actually half the size of Ralph's set because he was enormous. And <laughs> also he shot on with cameras that had much different lenses. So things look a lot smaller back then. But anyway, we wanted to make a set where there's no tchotchkes. I just think there's so much put into, like, the realism of sitcom sets that it takes away from the funny. When you watch sitcoms that are shot on sets, that there's tons of design choices on the walls and William sonoma and throw pillows and a big couch and that stuff. I find it very distracting. So what I asked for was just a set where it's just blank walls, like the Honeymooners, just nothing and uh, I wanted to be in a little box and have nowhere to go and have the energy just stay trapped. And we don't have an, a couch. We're the only sitcom you'll ever see these days that doesn't have a sofa. You have a kitchen table. Um, we have a kitchen table and chairs. And so people have to sit upright or stand and really hurl at each other. Like it's really <laughs> it makes it very confrontational. And everything's hard wood and linoleum. Um, and if you look at the bedroom on our set, the bed isn't in the center, you know, these master bedrooms that these rich sitcom people live in with a nice table and lamp on each side where the bed's shoved over to the wall, which makes it very hard to shoot bedroom scenes. And there's a scabbed in door like the landlord just put in some drywall and faked a door into our apartment. It's a really miserable place that we live in. <laughs> but it echoes where I lived when I lived in Greenpoint with my wife and kid. We lived in just a disgusting place where you're smoking your neighbor's cigarette constantly through the wall. And, <laughs> you know, and you have no choices. And there's a big transformer outside of our window that's going, eh, which I, I wanted to actually put that sound in throughout really the annoying, soundtrack of though. the that's show. That's annoying sound. It's horrible. Yeah, we couldn't have had that. But so we really worked hard to make this that way, to make it realist, but also mm -hmm. very theatrical and, and flat looking. We, we, we want people to be focused on the performers and the writing. 